in Simsbury, Connecticut on 62 Fernwood Drive. Nick, what war were you in and what branch of the service? Well, I enlisted in the Navy in World War II in 1942. What was your rank when you left the service? I was a chief pharmacist mate. They, that is no longer used, the term pharmacist mate as hospital corpsman, a medic, whatever. But uh, in the Navy, the pharmacist mate was the, uh, was the medic. And in the Navy, do they have like captains, lieutenants, sergeants for rank? You know how you have a lieutenant or a captain? Well, they're ensign, oh, okay. lieutenant JG, full lieutenant, and so on. Lieutenant commander, commander, captain, whatever, and right? And chief pharmacist mate? Well, the chief pharmacist mate is the enlisted man. <clears throat> that brings me to the next question. Uh, Were you drafted or did you enlist? No, I enlisted in Boston, Massachusetts. Is Home of the old Ironsides. Is that where you were living at the time? Yes. Why did you join? <laughs> Everybody joined it at that time. We were, it was not too long after Pearl Harbor, and uh, it was just that groundswell of patriotism, and you felt duty to your country. And uh, Boston being a Navy town, it was only natural, I guess, that I joined the Navy. That was my next question. Why did you pick the Navy? Because that was the thing to do if you lived in Boston? That's right. And I always uh, felt that it would be uh, kind of nice to visit some other countries of the world. Do you recall your first days in service? I sure do. When uh, after enlisting, because I was a pharmacist mate, they uh, sent me to the Chelsea Naval Hospital. And uh, they had one of the wards converted to uh, um, barracks, you might say, for the corpsman that as you came in. I don't think I slept a single bit that night. And the other fellows in the and the war didn't sleep very well either. We just wondered, what, you know, this is the beginning. What's going to happen? How is my life going to change? Et cetera, et cetera. All these things are going through your mind. But you're young and you're in the 20s and, you know. How old were you at that time when you were living? 22. Did you have boot camp or basic training? No. No, I didn't because... Uh, when I enlisted, I was a, at that time a registered nurse as a civilian, and uh, my cl my classmates, the females, became officers when they enlisted, and uh, I suppose you might say they sent me to Ch Chelsea Naval Hospital to get some kind of uh, training. But fortunately, I'd had some military training in high school. In the high school, uh, high schools of Boston, they had what they call the Boston School Cadets, and uh, you learned discipline and marching and uh, obeying orders, that sort of thing. And believe me, it uh, it was very valuable to me because I didn't find any real problems uh, in the, in the first. Uh, Part because I, I understood uh, the military discipline and so forth. Oh, I had to learn much, but um, I don't think I had that shock that some felt uh, about the uh, early days. Where was Chelsea Naval Hospital? In Boston? Well, it's a, yes, it's a suburb of Boston. I don't think the hospital exists any longer, and as you know, they possibly know they closed the Navy Yard, but uh, it was a big naval uh, center, and uh, it would be natural that they'd have a hospital close by. What were the beginning days of your service like? What kind of training did you have? 
Well, as I say, when I was sent to the Chelsea Naval Hospital uh, to get training, I was assigned to uh, uh, <clears throat> one of the uh, uh, clinics because one of the girls, one of the nurses who was in charge of the clinic knew who I was and knew my background. So we sort of got together and I was assigned to her clinic and I worked there for about a month, eye, in, eye ear, nose and throat. And um, it was uh, strictly medical, surgical procedures, and uh, which was nothing new to me. And after about a month there, I was assigned to a uh, to ship. And uh, of course, that's what you go to the Navy for, hoping that you will be <laughs> you will be assigned to the fleet. So that's. Do you remember what ship you were assigned? To? Oh yes, I certainly do. I was sent to uh, with my sea bag and all my equipment, thinking I was going to get on a battleship or something. And <laughs> the boat I was on <laughs> was a converted fishing trawler. <laughs> and uh, of course, now I know that I didn't know then was that the uh, uh, Nazi submarines were doing a great job in uh, sinking our shipping along the coast and of course the convoys across the Atlantic. And uh, the Navy was getting, taking all kinds of ships that they possibly could and converting them for uh, submarine anti-warfare. And we were one of those ships. So I was on that for, uh, or on the coast, and that's where you get your real training, getting seasick and all the rest of it. and. Uh, we patrolled off the coast of Maine and uh, down toward New York, that area. And that was really our shakedown crews and our training. And uh, it was uh, it was kind of rough because uh, the crew was just thrown together. Uh, we were all called ourselves civilians. We weren't really uh, old time Navy people. We had a few aboard, thank goodness. and. Uh, from that, uh, from those early days, we got hammered into being a crew. And after a few months of that, we were sent down the coast of the United States, patrolling as we went down, and it finally ended up at uh, Guantanamo Bay in Cuba, where there was a big naval, still a big naval base. And we were there for a few weeks. And uh, then we were sent to Panama and uh, went through the Panama Canal, which was a nice experience. And when we got to the Pacific side of the Panama Canal, we uh, um, joined a convoy of small vessels. Some of them were converted tuna fishing boats from, from the west coast and some uh, SCs, subchasers, and PCs, which are patrol craft. And we surrounded a uh, huge oil tanker as escort for the tanker, and from which we were refueled at sea. And uh, about once a week, we got some fresh bread that was uh, given to us, which was kind of nice. And it took us to 21 days to go from Pacific side of the Panama Canal to Bora Bora, which was in the uh, Tahiti group of islands, which were at that time uh, French possessions. And uh, that was quite an experience plowing ahead day after day after day because we weren't going very fast. And uh, the Pacific was beautiful. It was very peaceful. We, that's when we saw dolphins that were swimming next to the ship and flying fish and all that sort of thing. What was the name of your ship that you were on? Do you remember? Was there a name? The fishing boat? 
Well, there was a group of fishing boats in, from Boston that uh, all the ships were began, their name began with an S, and ours was the Surge, S-U-R-G-E. There was the Surge and the Surf and a few others that at this time I can't remember, but uh, ours was called the X Surge, and we went by the number YP417, and uh, I guess that meant yard patrol. On your trip over, what was your job on ship? Well, I was the only medical man on the boat, the on the ship, and uh, that was what they call independent duty, where you had nobody directly uh, in charge, you're, you're your own boss, as it were. I had no medical person to report to and so on. However, as we were going across, we found that there was a physician on board the tanker. And if we had any problems, which we did, uh, we would uh, uh, contact him. And the contact was not by voice, uh, it was by semaphore, uh, and it was kind of tricky, but uh, we were able to communicate in that way. How many people would you say are, were on your fishing? Forty. Forty men and officers. What kinds of medical situations would you typically deal with? Well, people would be running up a ladder, stairways would call ladders, and in the Navy, and uh, all ships have a very steep stairway, and uh, sometimes someone would slip and they'd bang their shins, um, or if they were barefooted, they might uh, slip on uh, the slime and whatever and get banged up. So I had a little stitching to do and, and that sort of thing. Bang fingers, when we were called general quarters, you had certain things to do and certain hatchways had to be closed. And if your fingers happened to be in the way when someone slammed the door, well, you got uh, your fingers banged and that sort of thing. And where did you go from there? Where exactly did you land? Well, as I said earlier, we landed at uh, one of the islands of Bora Bora, or Bora Bora is a, one of the Tahiti Islands. And uh, that's where we really prepared for, we felt we were preparing for combat because they, on our fishing boat, as we called it, uh, which was then called a naval vessel, uh, they had uh, big awnings over the deck fore and aft so that because it was a pretty hot uh, ride going across the Pacific and that was all taken down so that uh, we would be uh, be easier to see uh, any aircraft or anything of that sort that uh, we didn't want to impede our vision. So uh, that's where we started getting, getting ready, you might say. And then we hopscotched islands. We went to uh, uh, New Caledonia. Uh, we went to the Fiji Islands, and then, of course, uh, the New Hebrides. Uh, and if, you, if we had a map here, we could see as we hopscotched along. And each time that we moved, we moved usually with uh, a few other uh, small craft and patrolled as we proceeded, primarily for uh, submarines. And uh, we did make some contacts uh, we assumed that they didn't want to um, uh, come to the surface to engage us for the simple reason that they didn't want to waste their torpedoes on this, this tiny fishing boat. But at any rate, that was, uh, that was uh, quite an experience. We went to general quarters uh, every dusk and every dawn uh, because that's the time when they would usually attack. By air or by submarine? Oh, this is by submarine.
when you were traveling around the islands, you, were you traveling with a larger fleet or just your No, no. Fleet you you just yourself? no, sometime we were by ourselves and sometime with others, with a smaller group. And eventually we landed at uh, in the Solomon Islands off the coast of uh, Guadalcanal. And uh, uh, that was uh, interesting to, to get there. They were still offloading ships, of course, because they had no docks or anything of that sort. And uh, so being a pharmacist mate, I frequently went ashore when I could to go to uh, the hospital or the clinic that might be nearby, either to uh, pick up some equipment and supplies or for some, uh, some guidance, some counseling from some physicians. And uh, sometime it meant that I would have to go back in a day or a week or whenever I could with one of the crew members who happened to have a problem. But uh, we got to Guadalcanal and uh, it was uh, shortly after the uh, Marines of the 1st Marine Division that uh, They took the brunt of our uh, <clears throat> the Marines of the First Division took the brunt of the Japanese invasion, not initially, but they, because when they landed, when the First Marine Division landed, there weren't uh, that many uh, real combat troops of the uh, Japanese forces there. Uh, but they kept coming in and coming in and coming in and some of later some of the elite units came in and uh, if you will recall your history up until that time uh, it was constant expansion by the Japanese Empire and uh, this poorly equipped barely trained uh, bunch of guys in the 1st Marine Division stopped the Japanese Empire expansion. They're the first ones to do it. Later, when they, they were almost decimated, the 1st Marine Division, they came in, the Army came in, and many of the fellows here in Connecticut were in that group that came in and they're the ones that pushed the Japanese back, but it was the Marines that stopped them. Well, my role had nothing to do with they. I just happened to see what they did. And uh, when they the arrived after this had happened. Oh yes, they had, they had the Marine Corps had been pulled pulled out. They, uh, there were a few left, but I mean, for all practical purposes, they were gone. And, uh, but I happened to, going to Guadalcanal, there was uh, an army installation there and an army hospital. It was the 52nd Army Field Hospital. And uh, so I went there to get some supplies and information and so on, and I ran into some classmates of mine from uh, back in the days of nursing school. And uh, so that was quite a reunion we had. Well, then our, uh, <clears throat> our ship, our boat, our fishing vessel, whatever you want to call it, was assigned to duty for many months traveling between Guadalcanal and Tulagi, which was another uh, famous uh, uh, island that the uh, Marines and paratroopers and all took from the Japanese. And uh, on Tulagi, they established a naval hospital after, just about after we got there. And uh, so that I had uh, friends at both ends of our little uh, ride across the bay, as it were. Uh, and uh, one side was the Navy and the other side was the Army and it was, uh, was kind of a, an enjoyable thing at that time. But while we were there, we were there for, I don't know, maybe six, six nine months, something like that, uh, or longer, uh, 
we were almost daily under Japanese air attacks. Not our boat, but the island of Tulagi and the island of uh, Guadalcanal. Uh, because Guadalcanal, of course, was where the Henderson Airfield was, and that's where the aircraft were that uh, took off that were bombing the other islands that were Japanese held at that time. So uh, we saw a lot of uh, anti-aircraft, not from our boat as such, although there were, there were a few times, but the, uh, uh, there was an installation on Tulagi of uh, a naval, uh, rather a Marine Corps anti-aircraft unit, and uh, they were pretty good. We saw them actually shoot down a few of the Japanese uh, bombers. So. <coughs> combat was your fishing boat? Well, we were not individually attacked as such. I don't think they wanted to waste any <laughs> any armament on us. But uh, when they did uh, drop some bombs uh, on Tulagi at one time, um, a lot of our vessels, small vessels, were in this bay and uh, we weren't supposed to fire on any Japanese aircraft because we would give our position away or so that was the theory anyway. Well, somebody got trigger happy and every ship, every gun, every pistol on the place was firing. It, it was really unbelievable. And uh, it was just lit up like uh, 4th of July with all the traces and all the bombs going off. I imagine the Japanese uh, bomb crew were laughing at us, but at any rate, that was the, that was the time when we actually were uh, firing at aircraft. But it was good practice, I guess, because we needed that. How long did you stay in the Guadalcanal Tulagi area? Well, as I said, I'm, I'm not sure. I'd, I'd have to look it up. You know, as time goes on, uh, uh, dates and times kind of fade away. But uh, from the time we reached Bora Bora until I um, was sent home um, from the New Hebrides, I think it's uh, 14 months, uh, 16 months, uh, over a year at any rate. Can you remember any memorable experiences while you were there? Well, of course, from my standpoint, the, the things that you remember most are the situations where I had uh, medical situations. I had, uh, for example, I had a fellow that uh, developed uh, appendicitis. I had another fellow that uh, developed uh, kidney stones. And that's a very painful, uh, for anybody who has that or has, knows anyone that has, it's, it can be very painful. And uh, what to do without proper equipment and all. What did you do? It, uh, well, the fellow with the kidney stones was uh, uh, on the ship as we were going across the Pacific. So we, I did have that physician on the tanker that I could uh, uh, consult with. And one of the funny things that he told me to do was to take his blood pressure. And so I had to tell him that I had no such equipment on the ship. I cuff? didn't have a blood pressure cuff. It's, that's another whole story. But at any rate, I told him I had no blood pressure cuff, but I, I did have uh, some morphine syrettes, and I did have some, uh, um, I don't know where, remember whether I had some codeine or not, but at any rate, I was giving him fluid. I told the doctor what I was doing, and he said, well, do the best you can and keep me informed. You know, this is like two aspirins and call me in the morning thing. 
Well, we pumped a lot of fluids into this fellow, and uh, that h helps to wash out the, uh, keep the uh, uh, grains of uh, uh, stones uh, moving. And fortunately, that uh, sufficed uh, to uh, keep him reasonably comfortable until we got to Bora Bora that I mentioned. And uh, as soon as we got there, one of the first things we did was uh, take him off uh, the ship and uh, to a uh, to the naval uh, medical facility that they had there. And uh, so I was greatly relieved to get him off the ship, off my no longer my responsibility. The fellow with the uh, appendicitis there again, uh, I knew he was. Uh, having trouble, but we were uh, in an area where we could uh, get to him easily. And I just told our commanding officer that uh, this fellow needed to go to a uh, hospital or clinic because I knew he was having appendicitis. So uh, we had one of the small boats that take people from the boat to the shore, and we got him ashore. And uh, that was it. But. Uh, I think those were the, the primary things that uh, many other things, as I said, uh, stitching up people and bang fingers and uh, uh, we had some cases of uh, boils that uh, uh, we had cases of uh, bad cases of uh, fungus infections uh, and that sort of thing. But uh, that was about the size of it. Were you awarded any medals or citations? Not as an individual, no. For your boat? No, not, no. After I left the boat, I don't think uh, there were, I don't think it ever was. See, that's one of the things that so many people don't realize, that these small boats are performing uh, courier service, as we did. Uh, uh, we refueled. Uh, the uh, PT boat squadron of uh, uh, J J Jack Kennedy. Uh, he wasn't with the group at that time. He was off somewhere in a meeting or whatever, but we got to meet the fellows on the boats. And what they did, we loaded our decks with the large 55-gallon uh, drums of uh, high-octane gasoline. That's what they used. and. Uh, of course, we would have been a great target. <laughs> uh, but at any rate, uh, these were loaded on the deck of our ship. And then we would rendezvous with some of these uh, PT boats and uh, refuel them. And an interesting thing about the way they refueled, they had these uh, small hand pumps, and they would uh, open up the uh, uh, put the pump into the barrel, uh, the gasoline drum, and then they would pump it through chamois, the chamois uh, skin, uh, yeah. and uh, to take out any of the impurities so that uh, that's the fuel that they use. It was very, very highly refined, uh, high octane fuel because when those PT boats uh, were speeding. They didn't want to have to putt, putt, putt and stop. They were moving. So uh, that's why it had to be very, very clean. Did you stay on that same fishing boat, the search, for your entire time in the Navy? No. No. I, uh, I was there, as I said, for, I don't know, 14, 16 months or whatever it was. And then I was uh, sent back to the United States for R&R. Uh, &R and a reassignment. <clears throat> and when I was sent back, I was sent back to the Naval Hospital on the, in New Hebrides. And uh, my purpose in being sent there was to pick up uh, a draft of, uh, uh, you might say, walking wounded. Uh, and uh, we flew back in st stages to uh, uh, Hawaii, and uh, that's where they were offloaded and taken to the, I took them to the Naval Hospital there. Then at, uh, in Hawaii, I was there for a few days, and 
interestingly, got to mi visit some friends at the Naval Hospital that I knew uh, from way back, both male and female, uh, and uh, <clears throat> was assigned to a troop transport. And I took uh, a group of uh, 10 uh, uh, Marine Corps veterans from Guam, Saipan, and Tinian Islands that had been wounded. And uh, I took them to the uh, ship and turned them over to the uh, uh, corpsmen that were in the crew of the troop transport that was taking us back to uh, the United States. And I think it took us about five days on this troop transport to go from Hawaii to uh, San Francisco. And then when you arrived in San Francisco, did you stay there or did you come back to the East Coast? No, I tried to get out of there as fast as I could because I had 30 days leave and I wanted to get married. Oh. So, so uh, I got to uh, San Francisco and finally was able to get uh, train passage to uh, Boston. And that took a bunch of days to get there. And uh, that was quite an experience, too. Uh, we traveled on uh, some old, uh, old pieces of uh, railroad equipment that was converted to uh, carry troops. And it was just like a, a barracks with, uh, um, I don't think they any went, went any higher than f four or five. But uh, that's what we traveled across the country on to get back. But at any rate, uh, I got back and got married and then got reassigned to uh, the Chelsea, to the Key West Naval Hospital. In Florida? In Florida. Actually off the, you know, Key West is that island, the southernmost island in the United States, all that sort of thing. That's where Harry Truman used to like to go fishing and all that sort of thing. And how long were you in Key West? I think I was there about nine months. My wife joined me. She was a registered nurse. And she worked for a while at one of the civilian hospitals down there because they were very short of nurses, civilian nurses. And uh, then I was reassigned to uh, pick up a ship on the West Coast. And I was sent uh, back to uh, San Francisco and was assigned to the DE-25, that's a Destroyer Escort 25, which was being refitted to uh, be part of the fleet that was going to go to Japan. That's the name of it? That's what you called it, the DE-25? Yeah. Well, that's what would go. It was actually the Wintel. W I N T L E, U S S Wintel. And the number, of course, was the DE 25. And uh, so I was assigned to that, and the first thing I did was to check on the, see whether all the crew had been, whether they had their shots all up to date. You know, the shots for typhoid and at da 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 da. And of course, I wasn't very popular. I didn't make myself very popular. But uh, that was my job. And uh, so I found that they when. They weren't up to date because you'd have to give them their shots? Well, that's right. And uh, <clears throat> by that time, I had a corpsman also assisting me. Excuse me. Yes. So at any rate, uh, that's how we began, and as people were assigned, uh, I felt it important to keep up their shots because uh, disease can be a tremendous problem, and uh, I don't think people realize that so much because we do such a good job in the United States of uh, keeping people immunized against the various communicable diseases that uh, are under control uh, now because of what we do. But uh, very fortunately, uh, we were, though assigned to the ship, 
uh, since it was being outfitted uh, or refitted, you might say, uh, workmen all over the place uh, repairing and reconstructing and, and so forth. We did not live on the ship. <coughs> the crew worked on it at times, uh, but we actually lived in barracks right on the, on the shore. And I would hold sick call at a, uh, at a clinic that they had uh, on the shore. So that uh, worked out very nicely. Was this new ship, the USS Wintel, larger than your fishing boat? Oh, yes. Yes, much, much, much larger. How many men would it have on it? There again, I don't remember exactly, but it must have been around 100, I would say. So it's probably twice the size of the fishing boat? Yes, yes. Yep. And then where did you go from there? Did you, did you ship out on the Wintel? Well, I did have a ride on the, around the harbor when they got the ship uh, engines. The harbor in San Francisco? Right. And uh, that was about as much sea duty as I did on the DE-25 for the simple reason that uh, a short time after that, they dropped the bomb. And uh, of course, we were delighted because it wasn't long after that when uh, BJ Day came. And uh, so that, uh, in effect, I was on a ship living ashore when VJ Day arrived. And uh, so then the next thing, of course, was uh, everybody wanted to go home yesterday. And uh, that, of course, took some time because uh, everybody that was about to be discharged, uh, you have to go through the paperwork and all that sort of thing. And uh, pharmacist mates, corpsmen, uh, could not uh, get out right away because they needed to be available to help process all the uh, troops being discharged. So uh, I knew I wasn't gonna get out right away. But on the basis of points, having been overseas, combat area, all that sort of thing, uh, I was able to get out uh, fairly soon after that. So uh, that's about the size of it. When you were uh, overseas, how did you stay in touch with your family? Well, they had what they called V-mail. And you wrote a letter on a certain size piece, it was a form. And that was then photographed onto a large reel of uh, other letters and then it was reprocessed back in the States. It was flown home. The reel? The reel. And uh, then they would reprocess it. And uh, that's what your uh, loved ones would get. Uh, this photographic copy of the mail you wrote. That must have taken quite a while. Well, it depended on air travel, uh, you know, they were going constantly back and forth, the early part of the war, or uh, uh, no, it, it was many, many weeks before you'd get something. And uh, then later, of course, it was uh, much, much better. But uh, that, was, that was the thing. And one time overseas when we were, um, I think probably when we were in, uh, on our way, to uh, the South Pacific, either in uh, Fiji, in the Fiji Islands, or uh, in New Caledonia, one of those places, we got a huge pile of mail that had backed up somewhere along the line. And uh, I think I got 15 letters at one swoop, you know, and was that sort of thing. But once the letters start catching up with us, it was, uh, was good. While we were on uh, duty between Guadalcanal and Tulagi on that run, our mail was coming pretty regularly at that time. What was the food like? Oh, boy. <laughs> well, it was pretty awful 
uh, when we first got out to uh, the Solomon Islands. It was canned and powdered, and that was about it. And Spam, that's what we called it, it was called Luncheon Loaf. And uh, it was a little too salty, I thought. And uh, that was about it. That, powdered eggs and powdered milk. And uh, <laughs> one of the things that, that we found, you know, they say never volunteer when you're in the service. Uh, Any time there was a large vessel that was unloading food, that we would try to get a working party aboard. And uh, we never had any trouble getting a group of men to go on a uh, vessel to un help unload. It was mostly canned food, but once in a while we'd actually get some fresh meat. And uh, we'd go down up the ladders and down the ladders and all through the hold and would come out with a case of something. Well, while you're down in the hold, inevitably a case would drop and would open up. And if it was a can of peaches, pretty soon someone would, we all carried knives, of course, would open that can of peaches and you didn't wash your hands and all that, but you just dip your hand in the syrup and eat the peach. And uh, by the time near the end, <coughs> the uh, the syrup was pretty pretty black, believe me. But it tasted so good to get some <laughs> even canned fruit. But uh, we didn't have any to speak of, and that lasted for quite a while. Uh, so we were uh, sort of uh, beggars, and then we found that we could uh, load. We had uh, converted our ballast tanks which were held salt water. We had some pretty ingenious people on the ship. They pumped all the water out all it, and used some kind of chrome paint to paint the inside of these tanks and we filled them with fresh water. And then some of the small craft that came with fresh food from New Zealand and Australia, we would uh, uh, make a deal with them. We'd give them fresh water if maybe we could get a little fresh food. <laughs> and that's the sort of fresh eggs, for example. You know, that, that was really something. So uh, we got to bargain pretty well. Because see, we could load up with water and we'd go back and forth between Guadalcanal and Chilagi and there was a place where we got water. I think it was Florida Island that uh, had water coming down off the hills. Pure, clean water. And uh, we would l l fill our tanks when we could and uh, you sort of had to stand in line uh, the ships would daily be lined up to get fresh water and when we could we'd do that and uh, so that's how we managed to survive but believe me nobody cared for powdered eggs or spam for many 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 years to come after that. Have you ever eaten spam since you got out? Yeah about 20 years afterward I tasted it <laughs> about 20 years after I got discharged. <laughs> what food were you most looking forward to eat when you got home? Ice cream. Would you believe it? Yes, other people have said that. Yeah, yeah, ice cream. Were there any supplies that you were lacking for other than the food area? Well, we had enough food to survive. We weren't hungry. But it was very, very monotonous to just be living on the same thing. And, uh, as I said uh, earlier, uh, we got fresh bread going over to the islands, but when we, once we got there, in the early days, uh, once we first got there, there was nothing like that available. Did you have all the other supplies that you needed in the way of clothing, laundry? Uh, well, yeah, we didn't need many clothes because it was pretty hot. 
so that was not a particular, we had go way back when we first uh, uh, picked up the boat out of Boston and were patrolling up to Maine, down to New York, it was in winter time. I don't remember exactly what months, but it was snowing and cold, and we had no what they called uh, foul weather gear. Uh, that was just not available. I guess they didn't have it. We wore our dress pea coats, and they found some old, smelly, oil skin, what they called oil skin, uh, rain clothing, and it was all stuck together, and we'd pull it apart, and oh, it smelled awful, and if you were seasick, the smell of that old stuff was enough to make you hang your head over the side. But uh, that's all they had. And uh, fortunately, uh, the uh, through the Red Cross, uh, we got uh, these uh, stocking caps, scarves, and I still have the scarf, uh, and mittens, and socks that were knitted by ladies through the Red Cross program. And they gave that those to us. And that was about all we had at that time, other than your regular dress naval uniform. But once we get out to the islands, uh, that was not a problem. Was there anything special that you did for good luck? <laughs> uh, not really. Save your prayers once in a while. That was about it. Did you do anything for entertainment? We used to sing. I think, uh, I think servicemen used to sing more than they do. Of course, for entertainment, they played cards a lot. I was not a card player, but uh, when we got to the islands, after we were there a while, they would have movies on some of the larger ships and uh, a small, like a small landing vessel would go around to the small ships and pick up crew members and take them to the big ship. And then we could, uh, or sometime ashore. And we would sit on these long coconut tree logs or palm tree logs, and that was the theater, and they have a big screen up on the. Do you remember any of the films you saw? Oh, yes. Uh, they had the Dorothy L'Amour uh, uh, series, and uh, you know, the beautiful islands and all. And here we were in the islands, and they weren't so beautiful. <laughs> but uh, yeah, well, I remember remember some of those. Uh, some of those movies. Do you recall any particular humorous or unusual events? Oh dear. Well, yeah. First time we were, uh, I think we were in the going across the Pacific somewhere before we got to Guadalcanal. There was a uh, contact, a submarine contact made, and this was not standing at general quarters. You see, general quarters is when you go to your assigned spot on the ship when you're entering combat. And what was your assigned spot? I was on the bridge. That's the center of the, the small boat. So I could go any place that I was needed. And with my kit. And so this time it happened not when we were standing at general quarters. This was while we were eating and so forth. Or well, some we ate in shifts, of course. And so everybody ran like crazy to their gun station or whatever. And I don't remember the detail of the commands that were being given, but apparently they were told to load a large gun forward, which uh, the, was called a three-inch 50. 
and the man put the shell in and evidently the fellow that was holding the trigger which you're never supposed to do when the shell went in it immediately comes slamming out and we thought it broke this man's arm so they called doc so I had to run up on the forward part of the ship and there's this fellow holding his arm everybody's all nervous of course and uh, so I got him down below and got him under cover and his arm started to swell. But it didn't feel like any bones were broken. But, you know, it, when it hit, of course, it broke a lot of blood vessels and so forth and so forth. Then I got a call from another place. A guy I said earlier before that you had to watch your closing of the hatch doors. Somebody's hand was in the way and the fellow whose job it was to close the hatch closed it. And that got banged up. Another fellow slid off the deck and gashed his knee open. He had shorts on, as most of us wore at that time. Gashed his knee open. So I was kind of a busy. That was all at the same time. This is all at the same time. All this one, one call. This was the first time that we had been alerted to a call, you might say, to general quarters. We'd done it a lot in practice. So this is fine, you know, <laughs> but this was the real thing. And well, it turned out that uh, no, s they lost contact with the submarine. It didn't surface, blah blah blah. But I had all these casualties. <laughs> oh, another fellow was running up a ladder. Another fellow was coming down the ladder. And you know, when you go down the ladder, you go down, holding on, so that the fellow going up is facing the fellow coming down, face to face. And they both had their helmets on. And you go down, you go down head first? No, you go down Backwards? by stand no, you go down by standing. Oh. And so or you turn around and go down backward. But anyway, he was going down, holding on, going down, and the fellow coming up, and they're going at such speed that the fellow coming up lifted up his head and gashed the fellow right across the forehead with his helmet, knocking the other fellow's helmet off, so he had a gash across here. This all, that one first, you mentioned amusing. At the time, it wasn't. But we laughed about it for many, many, many weeks later. Well, that was. I bet the next one went a little smoother. <laughs> the next call. Oh, yes. Yeah. No. Was being a corpsman a stressful job? It could be. It could be. Yeah, especially when you're seasick. I was seasick a lot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Do you have any photographs? I have, yeah, I've got some. You mind getting them out later? No. Maybe we can make copies to send to the Library of Congress with your tape? Well, I'll let you look at them. You can pick out the ones you think might be, uh, as long as I get them back. Did you keep a personal diary? No. We were told not to. I know some people did. Perhaps I would have liked to be able to go back now and read about some of these things. But uh, no, I did not. What did you think of the officers and your fellow soldiers? <laughs> well, like any group, you're thrown together with a group of people from all different walks of life, all different uh, societies, uh, different ethnic backgrounds. Uh, some of our officers we were uh, very respectful of, and some we tolerated, if you will. Uh, but I think, for the most part, we recognize the value that a person was to the crew as a whole. Uh, you, you're part of a group and, and uh, you've got to work together. Either that or you're, it, you're not a crew. And uh, so, as I say, sometimes you don't like people personally 
but uh, you recognize they're valuable to the situation in which you find yourself. Do you remember any of your officer? Oh, yeah. In fact, there was one uh, we had uh, while I was on the uh, <laughs> fishing boat, uh, we had three different captains because they would get promoted, they would, like the captain would get assigned to a larger boat or maybe he applied for it to get off this fishing boat. But uh, one of them, the one that was in command of the boat when I was going back home, uh, came from Connecticut. And about a year or so ago, I saw his obituary in the uh, Hartford Current. And uh, uh, I planned to go, and I haven't yet, to see his uh, widow and his children. Of course, they're all adults now. And uh, show them some of the pictures that I'll show you, because some of them are of him. What was his name? Uh, <laughs> We called him Fitzy. Fitzgerald was his last name. What was his, fr I think they called him, uh, I think his first name was John. But we called him Fitzy. Captain Fitzgerald. Did you stay in touch with him after the war? No. In fact, I didn't stay in touch with very many of the guys. Uh, we did for a while. But I saw uh, Fitzy. Uh, in Hartford one day, maybe five years or so after the war, he was walking down the street. And I was a passenger in a car, and I said to my driver, stop the car, stop the car, and I ran out and visited him. And uh, I understand at that time he was a uh, stockbroker. So, yeah, it was right on Asylum, Asylum Street in Hartford. Did you stay in touch with any of your fellow soldiers? Not really, for a while, as I say. But uh, the one of the, one of the fellows that uh, was on Guadalcanal in the 52nd Army Field Hospital, I still communicate with, like once a year, Christmas cards, once in a while a phone call. He lives in New York, of all places. He's from New Hampshire, and uh, we still keep in touch. Do you recall the day your service ended? The day I was discharged, I sure do. Oh, do you know what the date was? Oh. <laughs> I'd have to look it up. Isn't that awful? Uh, I'd have to look it up. 1945, I can tell you that. But I... Uh, and what was that day like? It seemed it was going to take forever to go through the paperwork and through the this and signing these papers and all that sort of thing. And uh, finally, uh, finally, it, and I felt so very, very strange when I first dressed in civilian clothes. I felt this very subdued necktie, we wore neckties then, uh, I thought was very, <laughs> very, very loud. <laughs> when you wear a black necktie for a long time, anything is going to be loud. You know? And you were in San Francisco when you were discharged? No, I was discharged in Boston, from Boston. Yep. Oh, so you weren't far from home. What did you do immediately after being discharged? I don't remember what uh, specifically. I knew it was just nice to be home and go out and well, I guess I bought some clothes. I needed, I need, you know, didn't have any clothes. I think I bought some civilian clothes with my wife. We went shopping, <laughs> and uh, I, I don't recall specifically. I wasn't particularly worried about. Uh, anything, but after a while, I uh, realized that uh, I was going to have to do something, and uh, as I looked for a job, I found that I wasn't qualified for what I wanted to do. What did you want to do? Well, I wanted to 
stay in the medical field related. And uh, I found that as an IRN, which I had, uh, wasn't what I was uh, really looking for. At one time, I thought I would become a physician, try to become a physician, but uh, then I realized that perhaps uh, public health or health education, something of that line. So I took, uh, they had this veterans service and to, uh, to do aptitude testing. And uh, I went through that program and uh, ended up going to uh, Boston University, a school of education. I majored in health education. And then uh, I worked at that for a while. And then I uh, found that I still had a year of uh, credit available to go to college from uh, the government, GI Bill of Rights. And uh, I didn't think I would uh, be able to go to get a master's degree, but uh, uh, I was encouraged by some of my professors. So uh, I applied and uh, went to Harvard School of Public Health. And that's where I got my master's degree. On the GI Bill? Yes. Yep. With lots of help from my wife. And after you got out of Harvard, what did you do? Well, let's see. At that time, I was still working for the National Tuberculosis Association, one of the locals, TB Association. And uh, that was about the time when they used to have these mass x-ray programs and so organizing communities for that sort of thing was what I was primarily doing and the associated health education of course. And then I got a job with the uh, American Heart Association in Hartford. And, and you were with the TB Association, were you still in Boston? Uh, Fitchburg, Ma that's Massachusetts. And uh, then I got a job in Connecticut with the uh, American Heart Association. And uh, I worked in the state. I helped to organize, we call it organize, to gather together people to form a, uh, a chapter of the American Heart Association. So I worked out of uh, Torrington, the Torrington area. And you were living in Simsbury at that time? No, I lived in Torrington. I lived there for about five years and then moved to uh, Simsbury. When my job changed from working at a local chapter of the Heart Association, I became the uh, uh, program director of the Heart Association with the state office, which was in Hartford, but it was the state office. So, Did you join any veterans organizations? Not early in the game. I joined the Veterans of Foreign Wars while I was still uh, overseas, and I've still got the membership card, believe it or not. And uh, no, it wasn't until, oh, maybe 10 years or so ago, I thought it might be well to join. I was too busy doing working and, you know, making a living and going to school and whatever. So, uh, raising children and whatever. And what was it that you joined 10 years ago? I joined the Veterans of Foreign Wars as an at-large member. I didn't join any local. And I was with them for maybe a year or two. And then I found there was a, a local in Avon 
and I got to meet some of the fellows at coffee hours and so on. And uh, I joined them. I've become quite active since. Quite active, aren't you the commander? I am now, right. <laughs> Did your military experience influence your thinking about war or the military in general? Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. I don't know how it could not affect anybody who uh, was involved for any length of time, uh, particularly if you go overseas. Uh, war stinks. There's no question about it. It's but regretfully, uh, sometime, as a last resort, it's necessary. In your VFW post now, what kinds of activities does your post get involved with? Well, <clears throat> I think one of the things that we're most interested in doing, we're trying to bring uh, information to uh, the students, the pupils at school. Uh, we have a program that we just, uh, well, still conducting to a degree uh, around the uh, <clears throat> Veterans Day. We usually have a program at each of the schools in Avon. <clears throat> and uh, sometimes it's an assembly. Uh, most of the time it's an assembly followed by some other activities, the children uh, sing songs or write poems or whatever, and they have presentations of what they have learned and so on. And it's very touching sometimes to, to, to hear this. But at the high school level this year, uh, at the request of the students, I might say, they thought it would be better instead of having a large assembly where they sit and listen, maybe, uh, that they would like to get closer to the veterans. So <clears throat> one of our people arranged whereby uh, in pairs, veterans would visit history classes and social studies classes. And <clears throat> we did that uh, this year. Uh, we had 35 classes we visited and uh, in pairs. I was paired with a fellow from, that was a Vietnam veteran in um, World War II, and uh, in a class of maybe 15, 20 kids, we had some give and take. So they had a better opportunity to ask us questions that they're interested in asking, not just what we were wanting to tell them. And uh, I think it was a good exchange. In fact, there was a letter that uh, <clears throat> one of the boys, or that boy or girl, wrote that was in our uh, newsletter that I thought was rather uh, uh, revealing uh, that uh, uh, unsolicited, uh, if I can find it here. Uh, this year, however, things were different. Uh, there was an announcement on the school system intercom uh, telling us that there was an exhibit in the gallery representing, representing and honoring all the veterans who risked their lives for our nation. Many of us continued on our day, yet there was something different. In our history classes, we were greeted by veterans like the ones who normally would have come to the assembly. Yet it was in a completely different setting and a positive change in the way Veterans Week was organized. Instead of just sitting in the auditorium for two hours, not being able to talk, not being able to ask questions, <laughs> and hearing almost the same thing every year, uh, we were able to get firsthand experience with these veterans. Many classes had two veterans come in to speak about their war experiences and how it affected their lives. Students were able to interact as well, and so on. So. We thought this was indicative of uh, our need to change uh, to meet their needs or desires. So uh, that was a, a big item uh, that uh, we had. Other things we do, there's a, what we call a Voice of Democracy contest sponsored by 
uh, the national uh, veterans of foreign wars, whereby uh, children at various grade levels are asked to uh, write. Uh, they're given a theme uh, to write about, and then the uh, uh, there's a judging uh, process that goes on, and uh, uh, the uh, prizes are a, a war bond. They're not a war bond, a savings bond, and that sort of thing, so that. Uh, we try to convey uh, some sense of patriotism and why, uh, why we feel it's important to understand our country and how it's made up. And that freedom, which we enjoy, is not free. It has a cost, and uh, that's what we try to do. Do you attend any reunions? No, because I was on such a small ship <laughs> that uh, I've often looked for it in the uh, in the Veterans of Foreign Wars uh, monthly magazine that comes. They list reunions in the uh, back, and uh, they list the various ships, or in the case of the Navy, and so on, and I've often looked, but uh, I've never seen it. And of course, uh, when you have only about 40 men or so, I doubt very much that there are very many that are left. How did your service and experiences affect your life? Just like the kids ask you. Well, I think there's a, a greater feeling of uh, patriotism, if you will, of uh, feeling for your country, what came before, trying to make it a better country, try to export to other societies the good that we can do. Uh, that sort of thing. It's, uh, I don't know how to express it. Uh, it's respect for one another. That isn't just as a veteran. I think that is goes through all religious uh, persuasions, uh, do unto others, uh, and so on. Uh, but when you see so much uh, hate and lack of understanding and uh, so forth, it's, uh, it's, it's distressing. And living together as we did, seeing other people uh, uh, and their needs aren't so different from ours. It, it's uh, tolerance, if you will. These are the things that I think possibly, having been in the service in a combat situation, uh, you hope it won't happen again, and it's happening today. It's, 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 uh, it's a little distressing sometimes. And Nick, you're retired now? Oh, yes. Best job I ever had. <laughs> And how many children did you have? Two boys. Yeah. Is there anything else that you'd like to add that we've not covered in this interview? Who oh, no, knows? They covered covered more than I thought we would, but <laughs> no, it's. Uh, I think it's also important, particularly now, that we uh, uh, become involved more in our local political life that I don't think we do. I don't think we, as a nation, uh, when they say only 30% voted, I think this is sad. Um, I must admit, I, in my younger days, oh, the politicians, you know, I didn't pay that too much attention. I think I'm I have been paying more attention uh, in recent years 
because I can see the effect it has in not paying attention. If uh, something happens locally that I don't like, I had the opportunity way back when, and uh, if I didn't, I have no one to blame but myself. You can moan and groan about the politicians, but uh, it's our responsibility. I'm listening more, I think, now to what politicians are saying that they are going to do and so forth and how they feel than I did before. Uh, I think before, the looks of his face or the party he belonged to or that sort of thing, and I'd vote for him. Well, that's not an intelligent way to vote. And uh, so right now, uh, I think I'm listening more carefully. And I hope I pick the right guy. <laughs> but that's, uh, those are the things that I think uh, I give thought to now as I'm older. Well, I'd like to thank you, Nick, for participating in this project. My pleasure.